All right, uh, today is Tuesday, September the 18th. It's 2012. Uh, there's an election year, uh, November 6th. Uh, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. And uh, we're doing independent third-party candidate interviews. Uh, candidates are going to be on the ballots that you can vote for, that you can vote for instead of the uh, Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, you, you know, uh, the, who are the Republicans and Democrats? Uh, they're the people that have the 10% approval rating right now. And uh, and today on the line, we have uh, Matt Matthew Solidow, who's running for Congress in Texas in district number 12. Um, his opponent, Kay, Gra Kay Granger, who is the, uh, the incumbent who voted for the National Defense Authorization Act, who voted to take away your rights at habeas corpus or, you know, to allow the potential for you or your loved ones to be um, just taken, taken from the government, um, you know, pure um, lawlessness, uh, no due process without ever being heard from ever again, indefinite detention. And then um, running against her um, is uh, Dave Robinson, who is, um, you know, the d Democrat, uh, who is just the, uh, I would say the other puppets, um, you, you know, on the other side of the strings. But uh, we have someone who I think uh, is a little more independent here today, um, Matthew. And, and Matthew, great to talk with you today. And please tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you motivated to, um, you know, become a candidate um, that, uh, you, you know, that people will be able to rely upon. I mean, I, I know a lot of people are wishing that they could vote for someone else and have another option on the tickets. Well, you're there, um, you're, you've got to, you, you know, in a sense, you're their hero. I mean, you're, you are that other choice uh, in the 12th district. So uh, good afternoon or good evening, sir. Well, well thank you, Thomas. Uh, you call me Matt, by the way. Uh, but, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, as far as uh, being here, I don't think I don't think I would go that far. But what I, what I will say is, uh, I think to what you were, your first question was, you know, why run? for Congress. I ran in 2010 as well uh, under the same district, uh, Congressional District uh, 12, which is uh, serves kind of northwest Fort Worth and some of the surrounding areas, including the hometown where I live in, which is Keller. Uh, yeah, got, tell us, I mean, while you're answering this first question, <laughs> just tell us a little bit about your district as well, sir. Sure. It's uh, Keller, Texas. It's got a population, I think, of, I think, point the last census of about 40,000. It's an outskirt of uh, Fort Worth. It's a, it's growing like a lot of places in Texas are. Uh, according to, uh, I forgot which, uh, which magazine it was. It was, uh, I think, a year ago, a year before, it was rated the seventh best little town to live in under population of, uh, you know, 50 or 100,000 people. So it's uh, got a very good standard of living. Uh, costs are relatively low. Uh, good school system, and that's one of the reasons why my wife and I uh, chose to live there. We've been living in Keller now for about six years. We were in uh, uh, what's called the, the HEB area, which is the mid-cities between Dallas and Fort Worth, and uh, when we had children, we were looking for obviously a bigger house, like a lot of expecting parents, and uh, taking into account a better school district. So, uh, and of course, like a lot of places in Texas, it's extraordinarily hot during the summer. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and that's, um, uh, you know, the only thing that's, um, that, that's wrong with the picture is that there's a Republican and a Democrat who's representing this district. I mean, everything else sounds pretty nice. Um, sure, sure. Uh, but, but yeah, that's the problem. You have someone representing your district that isn't looking out for Texas's or you know your district's best interests, um, and and, and uh, they're probably looking out for um, people who don't care about the Constitution. I, I would say, and and so what you know got so you ran t two years ago as well. So um, and I would say you know in a sense you are kind of a hero because I mean if you weren't running, um, you know people would not probably have an, any other choice to choose from. I don't think there's any other. Are you the only, like, third-party or independent candidates in your district, sir? Uh, I believe I believe I am. So. I'm not aware of any others. Uh, the last time I was uh, the only uh, third-party candidate yeah. as well. Uh, got about, I think it was about 3% of the uh, the vote. And um, it's, 
Uh, well, that's, you know, only, it, that's only 7% under the Congress's current approval rating right now. So, I, I mean... <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you, you want to shoot for a little bit higher than, uh, than, than that expectation. But um, I, I'm kind of uh, the mindset. I think I've always been a libertarian. just didn't know the proper uh, wording for it. Um, I used to be, when I was younger, I guess that you'd say a Republican, but more of a moderate Republican, I, in kind of the, the Goldwater Republican sense. I was, oh, well, was, that's nothing like what Republicans are nowadays. That's, right, that's right. nothing. I mean, that's like, you, you know, you might as well compare Republicans to, like, Lincoln Republicans or you know, <laughs> even Dwight Eisenhower, who I admire. Um, I admire yeah. some things from Teddy Roosevelt, even, which who I know is not too libertarian, but... Um, but, uh, I mean, so, yeah, there have been good Republicans in, in the sure. past. Yeah. Calvin Coolidge was, was, was pretty good, I thought, with the exception, you know, maybe the Immigration Act of 1924, but a lot of his policies were, were very, uh, what you call, fiscally um, con conservative. But I'm, I'm of the mindset that a lot, there are a lot more people who are libertarian but don't realize it. They're, in other words, they're, they're fiscally responsible. They're concerned about the nation's uh, well, probably all the founding fathers would be in that category. That's for sure. Sure, sure. And but I think they're more socially liberal. And what I mean by that is, when you're dealing with issues like gay marriage or a woman's right to choose, um, I think that a lot of folks are uh, more accepting of it. I know uh, with gay marriage, it's been kind of kicked around a bit, you know, California it was it passed and then it was repealed and what have you, but I generally think the, the average person with a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, from a social perspective, want the government out of their lives. Generally. Yeah, just get the government out of marriage altogether. I mean, do we really right. need it, I mean, to, to even you know, recognize marriage. People can call where they want. If they want yeah. legal contracts, they can make them, you know. Um, sure. Yeah, exactly. And my, the reason why I'm running, though, and just like I did two years ago, is I, I'm kind of of the mindset that the, the biggest concern I think our nation has is our nat growing national debt. I mean, even as we speak right now, we're, our, our, no, our, our current, National debt is in the ballpark of about fourteen point two, fourteen point three trillion dollars. That's just on um, the budget stuff so, right now. On the, the right, stuff on the right. Books. That doesn't take into account the unfunded liabilities like uh, Medicare and uh, Social Security, for example. And when you take into those those into account, you're you're looking in the ballpark of sixty to seventy trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities. And what that means is basically uh, expenses that have been promised to people by people who we've elected into office, and um, it's it's money that we just simply don't have. Now, there are other things that we can certainly uh, trim the budget with regards to, say, uh, our defense spending. Uh, as you probably know, the United States is currently in about 130 nations worldwide, um, and kind of takes on a, a, the, the property of being, uh, if you want to call it, a globo cop so to speak, um, we have more money every year going towards our military uh, expenditures than all the other countries in the world combined. That's oh, yeah. And, and, I mean, the budget for the military is like almost doubled since the beginning of the century, um, if, if not more. I, I mean, yeah. I we had a, you know, we could probably go to like... 2004, 2002 levels of military spending, and still be, you know, still have like the biggest military in the whole world. Oh, um, uh, I mean, well, certainly, and I would even propose even cutting it back more. Yeah. Because, well, we have to do is change our our philosophy, I believe, with regards to uh, our foreign policies. Well, here's uh, a question I, I th I've been asking people as of late because I thought of this wording, and I think it really encapsulates it that people. That, that aren't um, that might not have voted third party before can 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 kind of bring it down home is are we a republic or are we an empire and that's the question. Yeah. yeah and it's it is a, it's a fascinating question to ask yeah I the, the thing that I I think 
but, you know, where I mentioned uh, people thinking there, there are probably more people that are libertarian than they realize is, I, you talk to the average person, the average person doesn't want our, our country intervening with other nations. We really don't. And if you want to get back to a straight constitutional discussion, and that's where, what, where the real foundation and the real crux of the matter lie, our Constitution clearly states that for defensive measures, yes, we definitely need to be able to defend ourselves against the impending uh, invader. Uh, but what we've done since the end of World War II is we've become uh, engaged and intertwined with a lot of these other nations. And you look at the history of Korea, it was really something that kind of started uh, locally, and then we got pulled into it when when the UN got involved. It's, uh, in Vietnam, it was really a, a French issue at first. If you remember, it was a colony and of France. And uh, then by the time we got there, it was okay. Now we need the United States to come in and take care of this. And these foreign entanglements are really uh, well, first of all, they cost human lives, and secondly, from an economic perspective, they they don't help either. They they help selective groups. Well, that's who, what the <laughs> argument is. Like the war industry helps the economy is what some people argue, but that that in the long run is absolutely false. Yeah, and if you look at the numbers, um, our our national spending or, or the deficit spending per year, which adds on to the debt, increases exponentially. But we're not also not in including into that. A lot of people don't. You probably do. But um, the um, loss of the, um, the, the 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 potentials that could have been if if that right. was used somewhere else. So it's a double debt. We're not just in debt, but we're also putting ourselves in debt of the um, the, the potential um, prosperity that could have happened if that was used possibly for something else instead that was more constructive. Yeah, you're talking about yeah, you're talking about kind of like Bastiat's uh, broken window fallacy, where yeah. uh, as you know, someone breaks a window and they think, oh, that's a good thing because it creates work for the, the glass, the, the, the glass maker or, or the, the window installer. And where actually, what's unseen is the money, where the money could have been reinvested if that window had not been broken. And it's very hard to quantify. And from an emotional sp standpoint, if you don't see it, it's very hard to rally around it. And I think a lot of people, and in some ways it's very counterintuitive as well, but it also, getting back to kind of our military interventionism, we, uh, it fosters negative uh, attitudes towards the United States as well. Now, there are always going to be people, people that are going to hate us for one reason or another, and that has to be understood. But um, it, it well, they can't hate the us problem. for our freedoms much longer because we're getting rid of those. So <laughs> they'll hate us for other reasons. I well, I, and I don't. I've never really bought into the fact that people hate us for our freedoms, etc. But what I what I can say is people have kind of had a negative attitude towards us because uh, of what could be seen as putting our collected noses where it doesn't belong. Now, the average person, the average American citizen, though, I, I doesn't, I, is not in favor of that. Um, well, look at Vietnam, the, the example you brought up. We trade with yeah. them now and, and probably yeah, yeah, yeah. influence them a lot more that way. Yeah, and that's the other thing is uh, part of it comes down to also, from a foreign policy perspective, is, you know, not just bringing our troops home. And if you look at the numbers, you know, we still have 50,000 troops stationed in Germany. Um, we still have 30,000 troops stationed in the uh, DMZ, the demilitarized zone, separating both North and South Korea. In the case of Korea, for example, the South Korea in particular, and North Korea, South Korea, has, if I remember, serves, has about 40 times the GDP of North Korea. Um, and Japan, many times larger than that. There's no doubt in my mind that Japan and South Korea could certainly defend themselves and uh, be, do it quite well without our soldiers there. We also, I don't believe, need soldiers still stationed in Japan and uh, and the other, you know, 130 or so nations that we're around. These are the type of things that would help drive the budget down. I know uh, Gary Johnson, who is the Libertarian presidential candidate, is proposing 43 percent. Um, 
Well, you know, because we, we're borrowing 43 cents out right. of every dollar. I mean, exactly. literally, we're, we're borrowing yep. 43, and, and that's with a very low interest rate. Wait until the interest rate goes to like 1 or 2%. Right, exactly. So, uh, so, so I'm, I'm certainly on board with that, and I think we might, you know, we could possibly be a bit more aggressive than, than doing that. Well, you know what Ron Paul said, what a lot of people don't realize, and this point is not driven home, like as much as that point that you talked about, the, the fallacy of the broken glass um, example, is that Ron Paul in 2008, now the budget's a little different now, but he said in 2008, and nowadays we probably go back to like 2006 or 2004 levels, but in 2008 he was saying we could go back to like 2002 spending levels um, and completely get rid of the income tax and we would still have the same revenue. Well, yeah, you said budget, which is kind of interesting because we I, we have not had a actual budget released congressionally. We haven't had a budget in over three years, so uh, yeah, credit rating it, has gone down too. Right? Yeah, we lost our our A, uh, you know, our triple A plus uh, rating that we had when the uh, Fitz Moody uh, uh, rating system. But it's yeah, I I agree with that. Uh, I've also been a uh, proponent of what, what's called the fair tax, which is a consumption tax. Um, but but not the Herman Cain 999 version, no, where there are no, like no. three different kinds hitting you. No. From the, yeah. not, nothing quite like that. Um, it, it would be, you know, I've, it, it would also require uh, you know, the reduction in, in spending as well. Uh, I mean, historically speaking, when you, when even the highest federal tax rate was in the ballpark of 90% back in the 40s and 50s and got lowered to 70% under Kennedy and then dropped even further than that uh, by the, you know, the mid-80s, uh, or got down, I think, about 28% under Reagan. Um, traditionally, it's the actual um, income to GDP uh, revenue that the government was getting was only about 18%. So when you raise taxes, it doesn't get the desired effect. And historically, it has not gotten the desired effect. And we have very, as you probably are very aware. Oh, it would be a, it would be a renaissance. Like if we got rid of the income tax, it would be a literal, like, um, we would have an immigration problem of businesses coming over here. I mean, people right. be like, there's all these businesses coming here. What are we going to do? Um, they're, um, well, they're not taking our business. They're giving us business. But yeah. if if we if if we were the like imagine this like that that like it you, you know when you're traveling to a new town you see those green signs that says like welcome to whatever. Well, welcome to the United States, the only country in the entire world as of yet, probably an industrial country that doesn't have an income tax. Um, I right. mean, I mean, just a sales tax. Yeah, I think that's um, fair. They're, they have, you know, Gary Johnson was talking. The one that he was saying, um, you, you know, has vouchers for like uh, the poor and stuff like that. And it would take probably about two or three years for the prices to adjust. But I think they would adjust um, eventually, and they would probably kind of get back to normal. Um, and uh, but it would be yeah that would be a boom. I mean, what else? If like he says, if if I mean if that doesn't bring business back, then then nothing can. I mean, just completely. That he he means getting rid of the income tax, uh, social security tax. I mean, just the only tax um, you know that we'll have is like the uh, fair the sales tax basically, and that's it. And, right. Um, and I mean that would be great. I mean that would be um, you know that's a constitutional form of a tax, um, and. Uh, and I, I mean, it would just be, a, 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 I can't even find the word to describe it, but it would just be, you know, like a turbocharge to the economy. I mean, it would be huge. It would be absolutely huge. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it, as I said, it, I mean, that's, it would be very hard to repeal the 16th Amendment, which uh, Well, we started. repealed prohibition yeah. before, right. so maybe I, it can be done. Well, perhaps. The, the thing that has been going on, uh, the trend, Historically speaking, up till probably about oh, 40 or so years ago, was um, our debt would increase when war would uh, would take place, and then after the war, it, it would it would drop, and we would get down to somewhat manageable levels of uh, you know debt to to GDP, etc. But what's been going on, and it's a troubling uh, phenomenon is that 
we really have, I mean, yes, the Cold War went on, but that's been we're in pretty much closed out. We're in perpetual war, yeah. Right. Well, it's not just that, but we're in perpetual debt, <laughs> high debt. And it's a situation where um, we're, in a sense, becoming a nation that we are, we are trying to get away from. And uh, in other words, what I mean by that is, Europe is a very, for a, for a large part, is a very socialized, um, you know, a group of countries, the way they operate and the services they provide. And in doing so, it, it does stifle innovation in a lot of cases and stifle opportunity. Um, what's happened, I think, is in the United States, a lot of people have become successful. They, they protect their interests, and the way you do that effectively is using uh, government means. You know, through uh, lobbying, which provides certain favors to various uh, companies or organizations so they get special legislation put in place, etc. And it creates yeah, cronyism. conflict of interest. Right, and it creates cronyism. And in doing so, it, it, the consumer, and in this case also you know, taxpayer, which are in a lot of cases one the same, are the ones who foot the bill, but they're also the ones that are not, uh, that are being... Um, not taking advantage of per se, but they are the ones who are... They're paying the for their own competitors' um, right. advantage. I mean, right. it's like literally right out of their own pockets. They're paying their own competitors yeah. um, without, um, you know, without choice. I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that double debt. I mean, so I'm, I mean, the bailouts, I mean, most people, even right. Democrats, Republicans, everybody, most people... We're against the bailouts. I mean, look at yeah. Occupy Wall Street. That was totally against the bailouts. The Tea Party was against the bailouts. Um, I mean, I'd, but our Congress still voted for it because they were told the sky would fall. But instead, yeah. now, the Democrats weighed to trust bust like they look maybe at Teddy Roosevelt in history, the, the trust buster. Why can't we have a Republican like Teddy Roosevelt? But, but the free market way of trust busting is very similar. It's let these companies go bankrupt, and then they will be split up into many different pieces. Um, and then yeah. the mid-size and small-size banks that, that, that didn't need the bailouts, that did make the good managerial decisions, They'll be able to um, take control, and, uh, and of those, you know, you know, they'll be able to buy up the the debts and the loans and all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, and it would have worked out. But instead, what we did was take their money um, and then give it to the failures. I mean, that's just like, mm -hmm. I mean, sure. this this isn't um, like uh, y you know, little league baseball where everyone's a winner. This is the major leagues where if you fail, um, you, you know, you, you're not going to be rewarded like everybody else is um, because if you are then that's a de-evolution. Um, now, I'm not talking about might may makes right. We're all equal under the law. That's the beauty of the Constitution, where that's one place where we are all equal, is under the law and um, and uh, our pursuit of happiness. But in the actual, um, uh, you know, the developments of everything, the, um, the, the results of everything, uh, if we keep rewarding failure, we're just you know we're we're, we're de-evolving ourselves i mean in in a free market kind of way in a free market kind of jingo i, I mean sure. it's yeah it's it's just backwards i mean how, what else we're giving these people that don't know how to manage every, everything who do you know 40 to 1 bets i mean you know basically they they're doing like las vegas type bets um with you, you know derivatives um and expe expecting us to take all the risk and them to get all the reward. I mean, it's just, it, it's worse than, it's a complete conflict of interest. And, uh, y you know, they're just downright stealing and robbing and, and getting r away with it. It's claiming that they're so um, too big to fail, that they're so, like, uh, intrinsic to our economy that we can't let them fail. <laughs> yeah. Like they're sure. special. Yeah. They're con artists. And um, so um, now it's, it's so it's good to hear about your this and, and that really I mean, so, you know, more auditing the Fed, I think, um, you, you know, the, the fair tax, I mean, just uh, physical sanity, um, basically, um, is, is, is what we're neighbors saying. What about some of the um, 
civil liberty areas. Uh, I, I mean, um, like, let's uh, talk, and, and you did go through it a little bit about abortion and, um, and marriage. Um, what about the drug war? What about, um, you know, the TSA, um, you know, the security versus uh, liberty? Um, Sure. Uh, argument. What, what, can you share some of your thoughts with us, Matt, about you know those kind of areas? Sure. Well, when you're talking about the uh, the war on drugs, I, I think well, what's going on in Mexico? People are saying it's a drug problem, and I would say that's that's a symptom. Uh, it's more it's an economic problem. If it, if it were oregano that was Ill illegal, then there'd be an oregano cartel. Uh, as other people have said, that you don't see wine cartels or, or cigarette cartels out there that are that are handling their business violently if, if disputes arise. With the war on drugs, it, it first thing it destroys families. And Richard Nixon first declared war on drugs in 1971. We spent well over a trillion dollars at that time. Uh, we've increased incarceration rates. If I if I remember my numbers correctly. We've got the highest number of people in prison um, in in all the civilized you know, in the entire world. world. You, I mean, even it, you know, it's Iran, China, China, Russia, yeah. all these other nations. And I think last year alone, we averaged, I think there were about 1.8 million incarcerations and over 80% of those were non-violent crimes. And not even uh, just non-violent, they were victimless crimes. Right, yeah, yeah. And, and it's a situation where we need to be smart about our, our policy. Now, I understand where some people say, well, if you legalize or decriminalize marijuana use, for example, then you're going to be raising, uh, you know, there's going to be usage increase. And there, there's that possibility, of course. But I think if it's, this is one of the things I think that, you know, regulation would be uh, applicable to something along those lines. Um, just for a public, you know, safety issue, generally speaking. But if something comes up, people will have legal recourse to uh, to follow through instead of. Well, oh, yeah, they could even make the laws stronger. Like if you were on drugs while you committed a crime. I mean, okay. but we're just That's talking about victimless right. crimes where right. there, you know, and where there's actual parents of kids that are in prison now. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, and and uh, so it's. It's it's a sad situation, and we definitely and it's it's ironic that you know we have a sitting president in Barack Obama who's admitted to smoking marijuana and doing other uh, drugs as well. And suppose he was unfortunate enough to have a police officer catch him in the act, then he would have had a public he would have had a, a permanent record, and he wouldn't even be allowed to be president of the United States. It's not likely he would have got through the vetting process. Well, some but, people might think that would have been a good idea, but in the big well, picture, yeah, yeah. But my, but that's okay. my, my point is there's a bit of, if you want to say, uh, hypocrisy, there's there's a bit of that with that. There's so, a, a uh, huge amount. I mean, that would be yeah. the very definition. He he promised to lay off the states, and now he's yeah. going after California and Colorado. Right, exactly. So, uh, so, I, have, you know, so I certainly have an issue with that. With the TSA, um, they... I understand the need for security in, in, in airports is, is necessary, but to the extent that it's gotten, I think it's the pendulum swung way over to the other side. It's a overcorrection and overcompensation, if you will, and it's it's something that I think can be done if, if properly uh, through private enterprise. I, I know that those machines that they have, where you put your hands up in the air and spin around. Uh, many of those haven't worked, and I believe uh, I was reading, uh, in, I think it was the Wall Street Journal several months ago, where these machines cost six or seven hundred dollars just to uh, properly dispose of. Because they, they, these machines are a lot more useful. <laughs> oh, it's special. Um, another crony capitalism, like you said. Uh, yeah. it, it was the Michael Chertoff machines. Um, you know, exactly. He secured yep. like uh, um, kind of like oh, no yeah. bid contracts. Right. Exactly. Oh, and so, so, I, so on those issues, I, I you know, I, obviously you you want to be smart about it, but um, when you're when you're dealing with individual rights, and the fact is, when you're going to an airport, there's a 
really a presumption of guilt, <laughs> if you think about it the way it's uh, situated, because they, the presumption is you are guilty until we deem you innocent, and then you can go through. And uh, that really creates an issue. And, you know, as far as regular, you know, metal detectors, I, I'm all for that. Um, if it's a, sin, a, a situation where somebody um, maybe... Is, is acting suspicious in whatever capacity it is, certainly. That that would be just like a regular, uh, under regular due process of law. Um, but the way it's currently situated, no, we, we definitely, I think the TSA has uh, proven to be uh, quite a bit of a failure. And they've even done audits on it by trying to do tests and seeing how successful they are at getting things. And they found that I mean, the practical um, they've done things. pretty poor. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like in computers, some people keep looking at software when sometimes all you need is new hardware, um, mean, meaning that, um, you know, it, it, it took them years after 9-11 to get cockpit doors in um, all the airplanes, but, but that really, I mean, that by itself would uh, negate, um, y you know, h half of the um, types of plans or strategies of terrorism there would be in, in, in airports. Um, and, uh, and the baggage um, things that are reinforced, um, the c carriers. I mean, those are just hard types of hardware-specific things that don't violate people's civil liberties, really, if they wanted to invest in anything. Um, instead, yeah. um, y you know, they well, they for force us to bail out the um, airplane air companies as well. Um, but yeah. um, so, I mean, there's a lot of just practical things that, that don't invade people. Like, how about... Um, people that are whistleblowers and the FBI and stuff, maybe promoting people like that or people that, like, were trying to warn us about 9-11 instead of, again, just like the bailouts, promoting the people that were sleeping at the wheel. I mean, just practical things like that. Um, yeah. Oh, just, yeah, definitely. Just practical things. Um, and uh, so, I mean, this has got to be, like, one of the most opportune times um, if you're independent or third-party candidate being 2012, um, while the Congress really does, according to Gallup poll, have a record low approval rating of 10%. Um, and, um, and so, I mean, isn't the real way of holding them accountable? Um, uh, I mean, there's lots of ways to hold them accountable, I guess, but before we can even have investigations or things like that, we I think um, voting new people in. I mean, the, 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 the last thing they want is a high turnout um, because half the people that vote aren't even um, uh, re related to a, being a Republican or a Democrat. Um, and uh, so instead of not voting, how about just not voting for the Republicans and the Democrats, uh, maybe? And um, I, I mean, in any other part, I mean, place in the private sector, I mean, people that would represent you, that, that you would hire to work for you, that did this bad of a job, um, I mean, deserve to be fired. Uh, I mean, yeah. do, do they sure. can be nice people, that's fine, but um, let them be nice in the private sector. Tell them to get a real job. Um, you, you know, yeah. Um, so Certainly. instead of yelling shame, maybe yeah, get a real job. And now, who are some of your um? Just um, do I do want to ask you if there's anything that we forgot that you wanted to mention, but something that we've always asked to get just a little bit um, of uh, the psychology of, of a person a little bit um for lack of a better term is um, what are some people that um that uh, you find interesting um, either nowadays or you, you, you know that 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 might not be s living nowadays but uh, um, and why sir um, are you talking just just general terms uh, it, it can be however and any way you want to answer that basically oh um, sure well um, well there there's a lot of there are a lot of interesting people out there I suppose but uh, you know I've, I've been fortunate uh, with regards to people that I've had that have had a positive impact on my life my family you know, friends uh, my parents my grandparents uh, my wife so you know from that perspective I, I you know been fortunate in that realm uh, as far as if you want to say famous people that I would like to have met or you know people you want to have dinner with uh, I would probably say I always thought Ben Franklin was an interesting individual <laughs> to say the least um, I of course being a, a big baseball fan growing up growing up in upstate New York so 
I, I was a, a Yankee. I'm a Yankee fan. And, you know, Yogi Berra, I guess, would be another one. <laughs> as far as more of a uh, political figure, one of my uh, one of my more uh, favorite people who held the presidential office was Calvin Coolidge. I thought he was a very uh, interesting individual. I know he was silent, as they call him Silent Cal, but I think uh, he had a lot of good, innovative ideas. Uh, that, that's just a few, and you know, being a jazz fan, I probably would pick somebody like a Duke Ellington, for example. But Great, great. Thank you very much, Well, um, and... Uh, Matt, it's been a great interview. I think um, you, you know you sound pretty um, like much that uh, you, you know your principles, um, and uh, you would do a better job than probably you know 430 out of the 435 people that we have in there right now. After all, it's just every two years um, that uh, we, you know we give people the opportunity to represent us, and it is like an emergency break in the Constitution where we can pull that emergency break if things get um, kind of out of hand like they are. I mean, whether they're nice or not, whoever we have in there now, um, they're, um, they're incompetent. They really are. I mean, look at, like, you know, the State of the Union and tell me that we can't have much, much better, that we need to set our sights on high and possibly, you, you know, uh, have kids look forward to, you, you know, a better future. And um, so is there anything that I didn't mention and any um, events that, that you have coming up or anything like that, um, Matt, in, in closing here? No, uh, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to speak to you. And uh, I look forward to uh, if given the opportunity to uh, being a good steward of uh, taxpayer dollars, so to speak, if, uh, if elected. Yeah, and uh, someone who's going to um, uh, keep the district informed about what's going on, and, and so someone that, you know, you can, um, I, well, not to speak for you, but I would guess that, um, you, you know, uh, would give you more information so you can make more fully informed choices. That's, after all, what the Founding Fathers wanted. They wanted a fully informed um, electorate um, that yep. uh, was well educated and, um, and 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 we don't have all the facts to even know that I mean we need representatives that can um, you know uh, be accountable for that information for us and so it's votes um, v o t e s o l o d o w dot com yep. vote solido and uh, and I'll have that um, you know also displayed on on, on the screen and um, so, Matthew, it was a pleasure. That's um, the, um, uh, again, the 12th district of Texas. Even if you're not from Texas, you might not have someone in your area. Even if you're a Democrat or Green Party, I think, um, you know, this year, um, you know, Gary Johnson says, be libertarian with me for just this one time. Well, I, I, I see it like that. That's why we're interviewing independent third party candidates, Green Party, Libertarian Party candidates. And uh, here is, um, imagine sending like 50 um, people, you know, independent third party candidates. Um, so November 7th, we'll find out. Um, November 6th, we can make the choice. And, uh, you know, this is um, how we can make a choice. Um, vote for who you want to represent you before um, it's too late. Like, you, you know, what happened in like Nazi Germany or, or other places where, you, you know, where, where there were, weren't turnout of, of you, you know, the silent shopper, the, uh, you, you know, the, the, the people, um, just the regular people. Um, so, yeah, make your voice heard. Um, don't uh, hide it away uh, this November. And um, even if you have to do, um, you know, mail-in absentee ballots or whatever you got to do. So, Matthew, it's been a pleasure. Um, Matt, and uh, I'll say goodbye to you right after this interview. Thank you for your time today, and, um, and Godspeed in your uh, uh, campaign this November, sir. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate the uh, the time.